Thank you all for being here. We're going to get started, and I'm going to use, uh, uh, by way of our baptism liturgy, I'm going to use a prayer to begin our uh, class today. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome sin and brought us to yourself, and that by the sealing of your Holy Spirit, you have bound us to your service. Renew in us, your servants, the covenant you made with us at our baptism. Send us forth in the power of that Spirit to perform the service you set before us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please, come on in, folks. Grab a seat. We've got some coffee and some water in the back, if you so desire. Um, last week, we did an overview of sacraments. We talked about the word sacrament coming from the Latin sacramentum, which means an oath originally. Originally meant an oath between a soldier and the person for whom that soldier fought. And so an oath, of course, goes both ways. That's the case with all sacraments. That sacraments are a two-way street. It's an oath to God and it's a promise from God. So that is a kind of brief overview of last week. We did record last week's session. It is on YouTube, I believe, or will be on YouTube. Sometime. It will be on YouTube. It will, be, it will be on YouTube at some point, uh, as will today's class as well. Yes. We're going to go through each sacrament individually, and as I've indicated in the past, I could probably do seven classes on baptism alone, but because, uh, because we don't want to bore you to death with that, we'll just keep it to one today. So let's take a look at baptism. So what I want to do is start with investigating where do we see baptism in Scripture? Because we always go back to the Bible, which is foundational and fundamental to our Christian faith. So, in Matthew 28, 19, read this along with me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Who said this? Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Yeah, it wasn't a trick question, right? Jesus said this. And to whom did he say it? To the disciples. To the disciples. What do we infer from this simple verbal instruction by Jesus? What, what do we take from this very explicit language? The Trinity. Well, yeah, the Trinity, exactly. But we take a very, uh, it's, a, it's a directive from Jesus, isn't it? It's evangelism. I mean, it is evangelism. He is telling us to do baptisms. And he's telling us how to do baptisms in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Let's read this together. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Who said this? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And about whom is he speaking? Jesus. Jesus, exactly. And so what do we infer from this about the difference between the two baptisms, the one of John and the one of Jesus? What, what might we take away from this one simple quote? Anything? What? Go ahead, Alan. What is it? We can infer that the baptisms can be done by somebody other than Jesus, but more specifically, what is the difference between the two baptisms? Paul? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, right? John is baptizing with? Water. Jesus is baptizing with? Holy Spirit. And fire. Ooh. Right? Glad you don't do that. We have, and we're going to look a little bit later, at the distinction between the external and the internals of baptism. John is saying, hey, I'm using water here, folks. But this guy that's coming after me, this baptism is going to be real. It's going to be deeper. It's going to be spiritual. It's going to be powerful. Let's read this from Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. 
Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, Peter, in Acts of the Apostles, is now following the direction of Jesus from Matthew 28, 19, that we saw a minute ago. What do we, what do we infer from this very first word? What is that telling us about the nature of baptism, about what is required of baptism? Repentance. You're supposed to atone for your sins. We are to repent. That baptism is not something that's just passively done. It's not something that happens to us necessarily, but something that we participate in. It is truly a sacramentum, an oath that goes both ways. It has to do with the forgiveness of sins. And once you are forgiven of your sins, then what do we receive? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Who wouldn't want that? In Acts chapter 8, we see another section, a larger section about the, the Ethiopian eunuch that is riding along in his carriage, and he's trying to make sense of a section from the prophet Isaiah, and Philip shows up and says, hey, what are you reading? And he says, I'm reading the prophet Isaiah. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, hey, how can I? How can I interpret this stuff without any kind of guidance? That's significant about scripture study, but it's also significant about baptism. And so he tells, Philip tells the Ethiopian eunuch all about, all about uh, Christ, who Jesus was, and he tells him about baptism and what happens when they, they, they go down into the water and he baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but continued on his way rejoicing. Once we are baptized, we are to be filled with the... The Holy Spirit. And that should be a great cause for rejoicing. Acts chapter 9, verse 18, Paul got up and was baptized. Paul was a persecutor of uh, the Christians. He was a faithful Jew. He's riding along. He gets blinded. Jesus comes and speaks to him. And so Paul converts to Christianity. But what do we see? Paul was baptized. Now, it could have easily have said that Jesus spoke to Paul and from that point forward he considered himself a Christian. But what we see in this is the necessity of baptism in order to be claimed, to be, in order to claim yourself as a Christian. Baptism is necessary. Uh, Acts chapter 9 is another place where we see baptism. Acts chapter 16, uh, then he and all his family were baptized at once. Uh, all his family seems to indicate um, not just the family, but the slaves in the household, and it also seems to have included, perhaps, young children, including infants. We'll talk more about infant baptism in just a moment. So let's take a look at what the Book of Common Prayer says. If you have your Book of Common Prayer, it's on, on page 858, which is the Catechism. If you don't, it's okay. I have uh, typed everything up here for you. Without cheating... What is holy baptism? How would you describe to someone who's unfamiliar with Christianity what baptism is? It's the initiation rite. The initiation rite. What else? Washing away your sins. Washing away your sins. Forgiveness of original sin. Forgiveness of original sin. Very well. Becoming a child of God. Becoming a child of God in the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Exactly. Making a commitment. What is it? It is making a commitment. That's exactly right. Let's read this together. This is the, from the Catechism of the Episcopal Church. Holy baptism is the sacrament by which God adopts us as his children and makes us members of Christ's body, the church, and inheritors of the kingdom of God. Now, you all have elements of baptism that will be covered in some of the other questions that pop up, right? So it is the initiation, as Tim pointed out, into the church. What is the outward and visible sign in baptism? Water. 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 The outward and visible sign in baptism is water, in which the person is baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So it's those two things. It's water and that being baptized and using the words in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Some Christian denominations go back to that earlier Acts of the Apostles passage that says that Peter said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Some people will say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ.
Christ. But the words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel was very explicit. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What happens if you have a baptism and water is not used? What is it? It's no good. It's no good. What happens at a baptism if they're baptized in the name of love or in the name of Jesus or in the name of the powerful mighty one, but not in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? What then? Is that baptism good? No. No. Two requirements, water and uh, being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So if those are the outward signs, what are the inward and, what's the inward and spiritual grace that comes from baptism? The Holy Spirit, Lynn says. Anything else? If, you're, if, you, if you've got somebody and they don't know anything about Christianity and they say, I want to become a Christian, I want to go through your initiation right, and, and you say, okay, well, we're going, to, we're going to baptize you. We're going to pour water on your head. We're going to say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they say, okay, once you do that, then what happens inside of me? How do you tell? What do you tell them? You've accepted Christ. Forgiveness. You've accepted Christ. Forgiveness. Any other spiritual graces that come about? The only way to go to heaven. It's the only way to go to heaven, right? Member what? of a community. You're a member of a community. Cleansing. Let's read this together. Cleansing, Caroline said. Okay. Let's read this together. The inward and spiritual grace in baptism is union with Christ in his death and resurrection, birth into God's family, the church, forgiveness of sins, and new life in the Holy Spirit. The thing that you're going to hear over and over again this morning is this phrase, new life. New life. Your life through baptism is radically changed. If you think that you can be baptized into Christianity and that your life can just go on uh, willy-nilly as it always has, you're wrong. Then you're not doing baptism right. You're not living out your baptismal call right. Baptism is a life-altering experience. What is required of us at baptism? Is anything required of us? No. no. Yeah, we have to make a commitment. We have to make a commitment. Key, did you say yes without a follow-up? I said yes yes without a follow-up anything else what is anything required uh somebody said no nothing is required of us at baptism is anything required yes acceptance of god go acceptance of god and more specifically jesus right it is required that we renounce satan repent of our sins and accept jesus as our Lord and our Savior. This renunciation of Satan and the repentance of our sins is huge. In the baptism rite, we go through uh, a series of questions. The person to be baptized, or if it's an infant or a child too young to speak for themselves, the parents and the godparents are asked, do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that are against God? And you say, I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. Those questions are powerful. And I know that we do baptisms enough at Emmanuel that sometimes they kind of seem rote and we might just kind of, oh, you know, yes, I renounce him, I renounce him, yada, yada, yada. But it really is important. If we renounce Satan, that means we have to acknowledge his existence, right? And maybe someday, if I get brave enough, I might do an adult ed forum on Satan and evil, but it frankly scares the... <clears throat> living daylights out of me. So if it is required that we renounce Satan and repent of our sins and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, can infants do that? Can infants do it? No. 
It may be Mark Felician here. Let's ask him those questions and see what he says. He'll smile at you and he'll go, nah, 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 nah. Right? So why then are infants baptized? Lynn? Their parents make that promise for them. Their parents make that promise they're for them. They're going to raise them in the church and so on. Exactly. This is how the catechism, and you said exactly what this says, Lynn. Infants are baptized so that they can share citizenship in the covenant, membership in Christ, and redemption by God. Lynn is correct. Parents and godparents make that choice for children. Now, I was born, and my parents made the decision for me to be baptized into Christianity. I did not make that decision for myself. When and where did I make that decision for myself? Confirmation. At confirmation, exactly. And so uh, some might say, well, wait a minute. Why don't we just wait until the child grows up and has the idea uh, they can explore and figure out what it is they believe? Well, when I was born, I did not choose the United States of America to be born into, right? You know, what if uh, my parents said, well, let's go into an uninhabited island and let's let Christopher grow up and we'll teach him about socialism and communism and we'll teach him about democracy and capitalism and we'll teach him all the different political systems of the world. And then when he's of age, he will pick what country he wants to go to. It doesn't work that way, right? We're born into a, uh, a family, we are born into a generation, we are born into a culture, we are born into citizenship of a country, and we grow into that citizenship. A little bitty infant baby cannot be uh, a full participant as a citizen. They have certain rights that they receive as a citizen of a country, but they're not formed well enough to be able to take the initiative or accept responsibilities that go along with citizenship. So it is with the citizenship of the church that is the church of Jesus Christ. How are the promises of infants made and carried out? Lynn Lafferty already told us. Promises are made for them by their parents and sponsors who guarantee that the infants will be brought up within the church to know Christ and be able to follow him. If a couple comes to me, they never shout at the inside of the door of the church they really don't practice the faith whatsoever. They're not participating in the life of Jesus Christ, nor have they really renounced Satan or uh, sinfulness. But they say, hey, we want to have our baby baptized. Are those kinds of parents making a promise to guarantee that the infants will be brought up within the church? No. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah, it takes a great... It takes, it requires an enormous amount of discernment to determine, are these folks sincere? And can the baptism of this infant be an opportunity for God's grace to penetrate the parents and have them become more engaged in the life of the church of Jesus Christ? Yes. But you also can possibly, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, discern, hey, these people, they don't get it. They don't understand what the requirements of baptism are. They see it as a magic formula. Uh, they're doing it because it's on the checklist of life and what you're supposed to do or, or to make grandma or grandpa happy or anything like that. So we can't have just a blanket policy about who gets baptized and who does not get baptized. It really requires an enormous amount of um, uh, discernment, prayerful discernment. Baptism, we saw in the earlier scripture passage that John the Baptist was out there baptizing. So we know that before Jesus came along, there was some baptism, and so baptism has some ancient Jewish origins. I'll be quoting a lot from a book called Liturgy for Living by Lewis Weil. It's a great, great resource. He says, nothing in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, in scripture, corresponds to this rite of baptism. However, if we look at Ezekiel chapter 36, let's read this, this uh, section of scripture together. For I will take you away from among the nations, gather you from all the foreign lands, 
and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you, taking from your bodies your stony hearts and giving you natural hearts. I will put my spirit within you and make you live by my statutes, careful to observe my decrees. Now, the Jewish people have already left Egypt. They've already gone to the Holy Land, the Promised Land, the land of flowing with milk and honey. And they keep uh, disobeying God, and they keep running into political pressures and losing wars and being exiled from that Holy Land. The prophet Ezekiel is telling them, I'm going to be, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to get you back. We're going to, we're going to redo this whole covenant thing. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. What does that sound like? It sounds like baptism. I will give you a new heart. Uh, I will put my spirit within you. What did John say? I baptize you with water. The one whose sandals I am not worthy enough to carry will baptize you in? Fire. Fire and the Holy Spirit. Doesn't that sound like there's a connection there? So while continued on, nothing in the Old Testament corresponds to this rite of baptism, yet baptism became the way in which a Gentile convert entered the Jewish community. Orthodox Jews still practice it. Isn't that amazing? I didn't know that. The earliest references to baptism in Jewish literature emphasize ceremonial purity, such as after touching a dead body, rather than renunciation of, of sins. So a Jew who touches a dead body is um, now defiled and unclean. The baptism ritual in ancient Jewish origins had to do with being cleansed and purified, not with the renunciation of sins per se, even as Ezekiel had prophesied. During the time of exile from the Promised Land, which is in later Jewish history, of course, there was a hope for a new exodus as part of a return to Canaan. The expectation of the new exodus included an expectation of a new Passover, a new journey through the wilderness beyond the Jordan, a new entrance into the Promised Land. This journey would include a new traverse of the deep waters first experience of the Red Sea. The people of uh, the Jewish people of ancient Egypt, when they were led to the Promised Land, they went through the Red Sea, right? So going through that, those waters uh, was very significant in their journey as a Jewish people. When they had gotten to the land flowing with milk and honey and through generations, they had offended God and they had been exiled by God. What, what, they, what they came to know, especially through Ezekiel's promise, was that they would go back to the Promised Land. And so going through the Red Sea, they weren't on the other side of the Red Sea anymore. But that was a, a, um, it was a culturally significant experience for them. And so they knew that they would have to experience it again in some form. All Jewish evidence indicates that the significance of baptism for converts was the washing away of the defilements of the Gentile world. Every Jew had to participate in the Jewish mystery crossing of the Red Sea, the wandering in the wilderness, the crossing of the Jordan. Participation in that story makes one a Jew. One could be born into it or be baptized into it. If Gentile converts to Judaism were baptized in order to claim their Jewishness, why was John the baptizing, baptized, why was John the Baptist baptizing Jewish people? So what we just heard was that in order for Gentiles to become Jewish, they had to have the Jewish experience of going through the Red Sea, and in this case, uh, being baptized, right? So now we're talking about Jewish folks that were being baptized by John the Baptist. Why, why would that be? Just blurt it out. Anybody? Because the Jewish baptism did not include... Uh, in the name of the, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But John the Baptist was not yet baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit because he was not doing a Christian baptism. This was before Jesus. 
So why was he baptizing Jewish folks? To cleanse from sin. To cleanse from sin. To cleanse from sin. John the Baptist announced that the Jewish community at home had been so disobedient to God's laws, which as Tim says is sin, that they had lost their Jewishness. They too had to come back into the land again through the waters of the Jordan, confessing their sins in order to be cleansed of their unrighteousness. Tim Peterson gets a gold star. <laughs> that was right. Very good. So as we move now from ancient origins into uh, Christian origins, what did baptism become in the Christian context? And I'm just going to give you the answer because I don't want it to, to, to trip you up. Because this is from Wilde's book. He said, in terms of the Red Sea, the Jordan River motif, you know, that Jewish people had to have be, be, uh, re -Jew uh, reclaim their Jewishness. He says, briefly, that was replaced by the cross of Jesus Christ. Baptism became a kind of death. Jesus himself spoke of his death in terms of baptism. When the disciples James and John looked to share his glory by sitting at his side, Jesus warned them that prior to that time of glory, there would be a time of suffering and death. He referred to that time as the baptism with which I am baptized. Now, recognize this gospel section? For those who went to the 8 o'clock service, this is today's gospel passage. Jesus acknowledges the baptism with which I am baptized, you may not be able to handle, he says. And so there is a connection between baptism and the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the early church, baptism was nothing less than a dying with Jesus. Through that death, members of the church were brought to a new life, empowered by the Spirit that God has promised. The cleansing from ritual and purity became washing for the forgiveness of sins. To enter the new life in Christ requires not ceremonial purity, but ethical righteousness. The Christian believer repents and, through the waters of baptism, dies to an old way of life and enters a new life of moral righteousness. So this goes back to that theme that we talked about at the beginning of the class of new life. Your life is changed by baptism. Your old life, you are burying, you're dying. That, that narcissism, that, that focus on the self, where you say, I'm going to go out and get everything I possibly can for myself and uh, forget everybody else. I don't care about everybody else. That, that sinful tendency that dwells within us, we kill. It dies. Our baptism involves dying to a self-centered understanding of reality and being reborn to a life of self-giving grounded in Christ. Baptism is no insurance policy for salvation, but rather a commitment to a lifestyle radically different from that of the world. In the new life, we are dead to sin, as St. Paul put it. A dead person no longer sins, no longer asserts a dominant self-will. Have you ever heard anything like this before? Because I'm not saying this is necessarily new, but the way it's articulated feels new to me and exciting, right? Are you excited? Yeah. I hope so. I hope you're walking out of here today going, oh my gosh, I've got so much to do, <laughs> right? This baptism thing, I didn't realize what a commitment. If baptism involves the death of our old self and the resurrection of a new self, which is reflected in St. Paul's words from Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, then what should happen and must happen before baptism? If it's a death of yourself and a resurrection of a new self, what has to happen before you can be baptized? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Preparation. Preparation, exactly. You have to have preparation and education. And you have to be examined. I mean, if you say, yeah, I'll be baptized. Well, why do you want to be baptized? I don't know. I mean, I'm ready to die for my old self to die and my new self to be resurrected. That, that sounds like fun. You know? Sounds like a good time. Let's do that. I like your church. It's pretty old. So, uh, yeah, 
I'll kill my old self and let my new self resurrect. No, it's so much deeper than that, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, yes. Absolutely it is. When we go back to the very early origins of the church, we've already looked at baptism through the eyes of sacred scripture. As we get into the early Christianity, we have a document called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, and it's also known as Didache, which means teaching, and it's estimated to have been written between the years 30 and 60 AD. There's a lot of debate about those dates. But the reason I use these dates is because that predates some of the New Testament. There's some of the New Testament that didn't appear until 100 years after Jesus had died and resurrected. So this is a very early document in the Christian church, and so we can turn to that as somewhat of an authority on what the early Christian church practiced and believed. Let's read this together from the Didache. Concerning baptism, you should baptize this way. After first explaining all things, baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in flowing water. What, is, what, what, what leaps out at you from this? What? Trinitarian. The Trinitarian formula? Anything else jump out at you? Flowing water. Flowing water is interesting. How do you explain all things? Ah, first explaining all things. Well, it's hard to explain all things, isn't it? <laughs> However, what that first explaining all things suggests is preparation and training. Right. You have the Trinitarian formula that Jesus gave from Matthew's Gospel, and we have this notion of inflowing water. Do we use flowing water in the cistern here? Sort of, yeah. We, Laura Lewandowski saying we pour on top of the child's head, that's flowing. Uh, does it mean, though, that we're supposed to go to Rapid Creek and do our baptisms? <laughs> Read this with me. But if you have no running water, baptize in other water. And if you cannot do so in cold water, then warm water. All that's telling us is, just do it. Just do it. Please do some baptisms. Read again. If you have very little Pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Read again. Before the baptism, both the baptizer and the candidate for baptism, plus any others in case, should ask. The candidate should fast for one or two days before you That's part of the preparation portion of this. In about 150 AD, Justin Martyr said, Baptism does not stand alone. It follows upon the instruction in Christian truth and a period of testing, teaching the Christian faith by the community and profession of it by the candidates in word and deed are prerequisites to the celebration of the baptismal liturgy. What are prerequisites? What is a prerequisite to baptism according to Justin Martyr about 150, 150 years after Christ? What is it? Preparation. 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 Testing. Testing. Testing, right? In word and deed. You have to show that you're willing to live the life of a Christian. And what is the life of a Christian? How do you show that? By service to others rather than service to self. About 50 years later, Hippolytus, around the year 200 AD, said, Candidates remained catechumens for a three-year period of preparation for baptism. Since they were not baptized, they could not attend Eucharist. Regarding this three-year prep time, it was a time of a gradual shifting of one's center of life from the world to Christ. What is significant about this phrase, a gradual shifting? That it happened while you learned? It happens while you learned? It, it takes time. Exactly. You get a cool start for sure. <laughs> it takes time. How often do we get filled with excitement and enthusiasm and say, Oh, I want to be baptized. Oh, I, this is so fantastic. I'm on fire with the Lord. And then we find out that that enthusiasm begins to wane. 
Because being baptized and choosing to walk in the way of Christ is not merely an emotional decision, but it's an intellectual one as well. It takes time for us to lose our habits, doesn't it? Right? I promise you, if I sincerely worked hard at breaking my Popeye's habit, it could take three years or more, right? We are so ingrained with ourselves that it takes time to prove in word and deed that we do follow, want to follow in the way of Jesus Christ. It's a gradual shifting of one center of life from the world to Christ. He also said, and when those who are to receive baptism are chosen, let their life be examined. Have they lived good lives when they were catechumens? Have they honored the widows? Have they visited the sick? Have they done every kind of good work? And when those who brought them bear witness to each, he has, let them hear the gospel. Yes, Bob? That sounds a whole lot more like confirmation than baptism. It does sound like confirmation more so than baptism, right? In the early church, there wasn't much distinction between baptism and confirmation, and they happened uh, congruently. Um, that changed as we began to see the shift towards infant baptisms, though. Well, I don't see how any infant can do anything there. An infant can't, but the infant's parents can, and can speak and demonstrate that by the way of my life, this is how I'm going to raise these ch this child. This is how I'm going to set the example in word and deed, right? The responsibility of the parents and the godparents at a baptism is enormous. The commitment that they're making isn't for themselves and their own soul and salvation, but for the soul and salvation of this child, this infant, for whom they are speaking. That is extremely significant. Hippolytus says, those who are to be baptized should be instructed to bathe and wash themselves on the Thursday. And if a woman is in her period, let her be put aside and receive baptism another day. That had to do with Jewish purification laws, by the way. Those who are to receive baptism shall fast on the Friday. On the Saturday, those who are to receive baptism shall be gathered in one place at the bishop's decision. They shall all be told to pray and kneel. And he shall lay his hand on them and exorcise all alien spirits, that they may flee out of them and never return into them. That uh, also sounds like confirmation, doesn't it? And when he has finished exercising them, he shall breathe on their faces. We hope that he used a uh, mouthwash. <laughs> and when he has signed their foreheads, ears, and noses, he shall raise them up. Again, it sounds like confirmation, doesn't it? And they shall spend the whole night in vigil. They shall be read to and instructed. Those who are to be baptized shall not bring with them any other thing except what each brings for the Eucharist. For it is suitable that he who has been made worthy should offer an offering then. At the time when the cock crows, first let prayer be made over the water. Let the water be flowing in the font or poured over it, or use whatever water you can find. They shall take off their clothes. Baptize the little ones first. All those who can speak for themselves shall do so. As for those who cannot speak for themselves, their parents or someone from their family shall speak for them. So as early as 200, we're seeing infant baptism taking place in the church, right? They baptize the men and lastly the women who shall have loosened all their hair and laid down the gold and silver ornaments which they have on them. Let no one take any alien object down into the water. Remember we said it's like dying and being reborn? How are we born? We don't have earrings, we don't have clothes, we are born into the world naked, and so it is with baptism. So let's talk a little bit about this infant baptism thing. This is Kelly Treble's little baby Audrey, and if you've seen Audrey, this is about a year ago or so, she's now running around and walking, and oh, so cute. If preparation for baptism has been an essential function since the beginning of Christianity, why do we allow for infant baptisms? Between the appearance of the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus in the 3rd century and the development of the standardized Latin rite for Charlemagne's empire in the 8th century, infant baptism replaced adult baptism as the norm. But why? 
Why was there a shift from adult to infant baptism? Take a wild guess. There's no wrong answers. Infant death. Yes, infant mortality. Donna Burnett gets a, gets a good star. Infant baptism was perhaps influenced by the high rate of infant mortality and the fear of infants dying unbaptized. Makes sense, right? Infant, uh, the argument for infant baptism today, of course, has nothing to do with infant mortality. It does have a great deal to do with membership in the Christian community. Children grow into the meaning of their membership in the people of God, but they belong to the community all along. Go back to the initial analogy that I used. I was born an American citizen. I had to grow into my citizenship in our country. Now, there are some connections. We said that baptism is a dying of the old self and a resurrection of a new self. And so we would never talk about this at a baptism of an infant child. Because we don't want to talk about that infant child's death, right? We don't want to talk about 80 or 90 years from now when they're going to have their funeral. So we don't touch these things, but we can talk about it in a, in a class like this. What are the funeral connections with baptism, what elements are present at funerals that remind us or harken back to baptism? Resurrection to water. life. Water? What was it? The Trinity. The Trinity. We do use the Trinity. Anything else? The Paul. The Paul? What else? And the Paschal candle. Oh, yeah. So the water, we sprinkle the casket with holy water, reminds us, of, reminds us of their baptism. We light the Paschal candle, which we also do at, um, uh, at baptism, thank you. And the funeral pall is like the white garment that we dress babies in, or if anybody that's being baptized should be in some form of white, as a, as a reflection of the purity into which they are now being born. The purity uh, of the new life in Christ that they have. So we bring these things back. Now, in older churches, like in the churches in England, the baptismal font is near the back door of the church. And that is because when you became, when you went for three years and you studied and you were fine, remember it said they were, you were not allowed into the Eucharist at that time. So the catechumens would come in, they would be baptized at the back door of the church as a way of representing uh, the significance of their entrance into the church, the body of Christ, and then they move forward towards the altar and towards the Eucharist, right? That's a baptism. At the funeral, in those old cathedrals and churches in England, the body is received at the back of the church next to the baptismal font, and there are certain entrance rites that begin the funeral liturgy right there where they were baptized. It comes full circle all over again. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> I mean, I can't believe you're not jumping up and down like I am. This is incredible that, that God has instilled this gift in the church. You can look on pages 497 and 498. You don't have to. Here are some prayers from the funeral liturgy. Read the first one aloud with me. Our brother and sister was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him or her fellowship with all your saints. That's part of the prayers of the people at a funeral liturgy. It's what the deacons pray. It's wedged in there, and so you might miss it, especially if you're at a funeral and you're grief-stricken. But we're praying. We're, we're reminding ourselves and reminding God, hey, this person was baptized. Something important happened. Then there is a, uh, a concluding prayer. Read this with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our brother or sister who was reborn by water and his spirit in holy baptism. Grant that his or her death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow and where you live and reign, the Father and His Holy Spirit, to the ages of ages. Amen. Who was reborn by water and the Spirit in holy baptism, grant that His death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. 
So as we round the bend and we come close to the 10 o'clock hour, um, just briefly, baptism theology. What does baptism do? Read this with me. Holy baptism is full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit into Christ's body and the church. The bond which God establishes in baptism is indissoluble. It is full initiation. Is there anything else that you need to do to be a Christian? Do you have to have confirmation in order to be a Christian? No. No. Baptism is full initiation. It is by water. If you don't have water, like somebody, I told the story last week, somebody was baptized with white rose petals, as pretty as that might sound, that ain't baptism. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is there. Remember John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but the one to come after me will, be back, will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. It's into Christ's body, the church. So it, it's, it's not that you're being baptized for yourself. You are being baptized into something larger than yourself. Christ's body, the church. You have now become a member of the Christian church. It's a bond. Remember the, the word sacramentum that we talked about? A soldier's oath. Right? That bond. And a bond with God, which God establishes, can you break it? No. 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 It's indissoluble. It is indissoluble. I find it interesting that the Catechism uses a word which has its roots and its origins in water. Because when you, when you say something is, is soluble, right, you pour water and it dissolves. But here, the opposite happens. Baptism is the radical sign of a new framework for human life, a life sustained by the power of the Spirit that is Christ. Baptism is always a question of the relation to Christ in and through the church. It is the most churchly of all liturgical activities because it is the action that makes explicit the union of Christians with their Lord in the context of their relation to each other. For this reason, baptism has been traditionally understood as the door to all other sacramental activity. Eucharist, marriage, anointing of the sick, penance, ordination, all presume the essential act of baptism, participation in the Christian mystery through membership in the church. We are not baptized for ourselves. We are not baptized by ourselves. We are not baptized in order to live in isolation from one another. Yes, we are united individually with Jesus Christ, but we are united with Christ through one another. If you have someone who says, I want to have my child baptized, but I do not want to belong to the church, that is anathema to what baptism is all about. Furthermore, baptism is required for entrance into all the other sacraments. Now, there's a big debate in the Episcopal Church. And I have a very definite opinion about it. I'll even tell you what it is. But it was discussed at the most recent general convention, and it was put aside, and it was not taken up any longer. And I hope that they don't take it up again. And it was this notion of, well, you know, we're, we're not being very hospitable when we receive people into our church who have not been baptized, and we allow them to, and we say that they can't have Eucharist until they're baptized. Baptism is the gateway sacrament that gets us to all the other sacraments. We look at the history of the church, and it shows. Remember it said, for three years they were catechumens, and they were not allowed to go to the Eucharist, much less receive the Eucharist. We have 2,000 years of history that people want to throw away just because they want to make everybody feel good. <laughs> I have a strong opinion about it. Giving communion to people who are not baptized is not going to make the world implode on itself. However, we want to continue to uphold what we have been taught, what we have been given, and what we have learned. Baptism comes first. When should baptism be done? Usually within the Eucharist. Why? Because we're not being baptized for ourselves, we're being baptized in the body of Christ in membership of the church. Here are some days that are especially appropriate for baptism. Who should do a baptism? Who's the primary person that should always do baptism? The bishop. The bishop. It is proper that the bishop do baptisms. Who can do baptisms? Priests and deacons and anyone in emergencies. 
Did you know that a Muslim or a Jew or an agnostic or an atheist can also do a baptism? You don't even have to be Christian in order to do a Christian baptism. Why? Because the sacrament is so fundamental to being forgiven of our sins, to being unified with the church and with Christ, and with having that new life being resurrected. If you find yourself in an emergency, what is needed for baptism to be valid? Water. Two things. Water and? You say their name. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For emergency baptisms, according to the Book of Common Prayer, the Lord's Prayer is then said with other prayers. The person who performed an emergency baptism is then to inform the local priest who should record the baptism in the register. If the person recovers, they don't die, a public celebration should be done, excluding the water portion. That tells us that it is valid. When I was a priest down in New Orleans, I got called into an emergency situation at the hospital. A baby was dying. I did the baptism, the emergency baptism. I didn't register it in my book. I registered it in the book of the parish where the hospital was located. That would happen here. So if, if you ever do an emergency baptism on I-90, call me and I'll put it in our book. And it's valid. How about that? What is the purpose of sponsors and God parents? They are to be, uh, holy baptism is to be sponsored by one or more baptized persons. Sponsors of adults and older children present their candidates and thereby signify their endorsement of the candidates and their intention to support them by prayer and example in their Christian life. Remember Hippolytus? He said, let them be examined and then let them say that they are prepared and ready. That's what, that's what the candidates and the parents are doing for baptized persons. Um, sponsors of infants, commonly called godparents, present their candidates, make promises in their own names, and also take vows on behalf of their candidates. It is fitting that parents be included among the godparents of their own children. Parents and godparents are to be instructed in the meaning of baptism, in their duties to help the new Christians grow in the knowledge and love of God, and in their responsibilities as members of the church. All this comes from the Book of Common Prayer. You can find it on your own. Will you be responsible for seeing that the child you present is brought up in the Christian faith and life? We will, with God's help. Will you, by your prayers and witness, help this child to grow into the full stature of Christ? We will, with God's help. Woo! And I'm through it. <laughs> now that we're all here, everyone here is baptized. Now we have to leave here and go and do something about it. God bless you. Next week.